Service to me means helping other people before yourself. Collaboration allows us to see what it's like from a different perspective that makes everything better. Happiness is when you have no care in the world and just dancing like no one's watching. Craftsmanship means love made visible. It means doing something with heart and really putting your, your all into it. My small things, my joy in small things other people do. And together, they could grow to something big. We are here getting ready for the food box distribution. Support the United Way. They're making lives better. To all our brave service members, thank you for your service and your sacrifice. We've all been affected by cancer. And because of you all, I am still in nursing school. Thank you for your support throughout the year. Thank you. Thank you. So we can be kind again and again and again. Blue makes it easy to fuel advocacy that lasts. When your cause is in the news, or when you're making every season your giving season, we have modern fundraising tools nonprofits can use to build a grassroots community that can give in seconds and sustain your work for the long haul. Learn more about us at secure.actblue.com. Hi, everybody. Good morning, I think to most. My name is Kristen Tatey. I'm from the Taproot Foundation. It's so great to be here with you today for our session at N10, a nonprofit case study in Agile. Uh, thank you to um, our partners at N10 for having us here. And it's great, again, to be with you um, on this spring day. I'd like to introduce my uh, colleagues and friends that are joining me here today and who are going to be really delivering um, the the all the fun uh, hopefully exciting and helpful content um, in this session but again for some quick introductions all around my name is Kristen Tatey I'm the chief operating officer at the Taproot Foundation I'll introduce the Taproot Foundation here in a little bit we've got my friend Robert um, who's a, who's um, a, a tech consultant uh, technical product manager, as you see here, um, but a uh, uh, fabulous, also skilled volunteer, or as we call them at Taproot, a pro bono consultant, our beloved pro bono consultant. As you'll see as I talk about what we do at Taproot, um, we deliver all sorts of programs, but those programs are actually delivered by our volunteers. And so Robert is one of those great volunteers delivering that impact to our community organizations. We've also got Terry. Terry, who will have an opportunity to introduce herself and her organization a little bit later. Um, Terry is an executive director um, and founder of a nonprofit. And she's utilized some of Taproot's services um, to connect with Robert. Um, uh, and she's going to kind of share her story a little bit and how it relates to agile methodology um, and how this kind of all ties together. And then Josh Anderson. Josh is going to is our director of product at Taproot and uh, runs our technology infrastructure. And he's going to again deliver um, again some excite hopefully some exciting content. So before I hand it off to them, I'd like to just give some brief background on the foundation. So a little bit more about Taproot and what we do here. 
as I'm sure many of you know and experience, there's a huge resource gap present in the social sector. Nonprofits who very well may have the solutions to our community's most pressing challenges, like Terry's, simply don't have the resources they need to fully accomplish, accomplish their missions, and our communities suffer for that. Our nonprofit, Taproot, is out to change that. At Taproot, we try to drive social change, and we do that by delivering um, on some of our Excuse me. By <clears throat> by leading, we do that do that by leading, mobilizing, and engaging professionals like Robert in pro bono service. Since the early 2000s, and we're celebrating our 20th anniversary this year. The Taproot Foundation's partnered with close to 9,000 social change organizations and nearly 25,000 volunteers, um, delivering nearly 215 million dollars in donated professional services to the nonprofit sector. In addition to Taproot's pro bono programs, we do CSR consultancy work, we're leaders of a global pro bono network, and we're committed to advancing the pro bono movement through further research, education, and events. So how do we do that? Uh, the Taproot Foundation has essentially three core areas where we further our mission. First, we have corporate advisory services. The Taproot Foundation advises and supports companies in developing customized and high impact pro bono programs for their employees and communities. We do that through pro bono leadership. So as I mentioned, through research, we drive social change by enabling pro bono service in the U.S. and through that global provider network. Taproot convenes leaders at signature events throughout the year and facilitates field building research. And of course, through our programs where we directly pair nonprofits with skilled volunteers in areas like marketing, strategy, HR, and IT. And we do that from one-to-one -one quick consultations to long-term team-based projects. We offer in-person and virtual engagements. It's this piece that we're digging into today, how our nonprofit, Taproot, leaned into tech and agile team management to increase the impact and reach of our programs while continuing to operate leanly. I'm sure that speaks to many of you, that context, so um, with that, and before I transition it here to my colleague, Josh, um, I'll just give a little bit more background uh, about our tech platform. So in 2014, the Taproot Foundation made uh, virtual pro bono simple and streamlined through our virtual free online nonprofit volunteer matching platform, Taproot Plus. We designed Taproot Plus to be flexible, and hopefully nimble so any nonprofit and any skilled volunteer, no matter how big they are and or how a business professional, you know, can support through this can support um, said nonprofit, no matter where they're located. So and as I said, it's completely free. Taproot Plus, this is our way of scaling up the pro bono movement and making all of those who want to use pro bono have a way to do that safely from their own home. As you can imagine, the Taproot Plus platform became even more crucial to how our nonprofits provide community members with pro bono services in 2020. When we were all pushed to work, volunteer, support and connect virtually. And I join you here from my virtual home office slash three-year-old playroom. So it's this, the maintenance and management of technology, of this technology platform, Taproot Plus, that we're kind of here to talk about today. It was new for Taproot when we started this in 2014. And it's very distinct from the work of our organization and the work our organization had done previously. So this, um, it's how we kind of ma maintain and manage this um, while continuing to expand our services and expand our reach. Um, that's why we're here to, to connect today. So with that, I'll give it to Josh, who is um, our, our all knows all things, our, our product expert, knows all things agile um, 
to share to share this part of our story. So thanks, Josh. Uh, thank you, Kristen. Hey guys. So uh, today I get to kind of walk you through uh, the behind the scenes of Taproot Plus. And for us, uh, you know, when it comes to agile, it's all about innovation. Um, in order to kind of give you the lay of the land of how Taproot does this inside of a nonprofit, uh, the first thing I actually want to walk you through is our team structure. So uh, this world map is actually a layout of our team. So we're a team uh, made up of 10 people. Uh, we're located across uh, right now three different countries and basically four different time zones. Um, so when you think of the idea of a distributed team, Agile helps us to manage our work and deliver the best outcome for our users on the platform. And later I'll kind of show you uh, how we're able to manage uh, a distributed, distributed team to execute properly uh, for our, our goals. So Agile, just a refresher course for those who don't know, and I'm gonna summarize a little bit here. Uh, but Agile is all about iterative development. So we're talking about collaboration most of the time across different teams or inside the organization to deliver outcomes. So what you can see uh, below is the actual visualization of our collaborative process. Uh, we have a product manager, a designer, developers, uh, marketing, and the stakeholders who are the people actually giving us the original feedback and uh, and inspiration for the kind of work that we do. So we go through a process from identification all the way through implementation, where each of these key players have a role to play in collaborating within our team to deliver this outcome. So now what does Agile actually look like uh, inside of Taproot? So fundamentally, like what I like to compare it to is we are very much uh, positioned in a way that feels a lot like an early stage startup. You're dealing with a small team of people. Every person is, has multiple roles in managing different hats, and we're all collaboratively working together, even across our different roles, to deliver these outcomes. So I broke it up into three basically characteristics that summarize this effort. Proactiveness, decisiveness, and adaptability. We constantly have to iterate. We constantly have to change. Uh, no week for us looks the same. So, and then as far as execution, being that we're a distributed team across multiple time zones, the key part of this is how we manage our communication internally, right? So here's a little bit of more insight into our structure and how we manage communication. Uh, we meet daily for about 30, to 30 minutes to an hour. We're walking through updates. We're escalating any problems that have come up either during the day or during the week. And we're adapting the plan as we go to ensure that we're covering our bases. Now that work that we end up discussing is all planned in accordance with a product roadmap, which is our larger vision for the year of the things, whether they be new features or issues that we wanna tackle, all that work is scoped out throughout the year and planned so that every month we have a plan of attack for what we're gonna accomplish in a given time period. And then every member of our team is focused on innovation and maintenance. So again, this dynamic of having multiple hats. Uh, you might be a developer, but you're also pitching in and coming up with new ideas. You might be a designer, but you're also taking uh, responsibility in making sure that everything on the platform is functioning properly. Now, this would hopefully give you a little bit more insight about the kind of work that we do. Uh, this is our product mix. So as a user, as someone who's visiting the site, you see the marketplace. But the marketplace is not all that Taproot Plus encompasses. Uh, it's one part of a bigger whole. So the other two things that make up Taproot Plus is our internal CRM. So our Taproot Foundation employees are using a CRM of data that we've kind of aggregated from the marketplace on a daily basis as they do outreach and campaigns for their programmatic work. And then we also have memberships. Memberships is our model with working with outside companies and corporations. And it actually helps, in addition to sponsorships, fund this idea of a free marketplace. We do not charge end users to be a part of Taproot Plus as a volunteer or a nonprofit. 
So with that, I'd like to get into a little bit of the challenges that come with managing technology inside of a nonprofit. And in calling these out, I'm also going to talk through how we, uh, how we battle against these to make them strengths instead of weaknesses. So we have resource constraints, right? Like we're not a full-fledged technology team. Uh, we're working inside of a nonprofit and those come with constraints. But it helps us to be a little bit more efficient about making decisions and outlining a scope that actually works for the organization. So we're always moving forward the things that are going to deliver the most value to our audience. Now, institutional knowledge. Again, our, our employees are not traditionally technology-based. But the, the, the competitive advantage that we do have is that we have institutional knowledge around our programmatic work that we are, allowed, we are able to spread across a digital landscape. So unlike other platforms, you have people inside the, co the company and working on this platform who are able to move pro bono work forward in a way that has a lot of experience behind what makes these products successful for not only the nonprofits, but the volunteers. And then finally, uh, this one I call nonprofit software as a service. So we are engaging with corporations on a monthly basis, uh, providing them a service. Uh, that service forms a backbone and infrastructure for how we, like I said earlier, uh, convey this free platform. Now we have the advantage being a nonprofit that we pursue grants and sponsorships in addition to memberships to be the backbone of resources into the platform. And that gives us a little more flexibility and creativity around what we work on and how we execute. So lastly here, and probably the most important thing is iterating through feedback. Uh, the product team, the internal employees, and our external user base all have systems in place to communicate their feedback and work through any work that's coming up on the platform. And this is, you can see here with the product team and employee feedback, is a Kanban style of managing stories uh, and work. Um, but what happens here is we're creating a cycle of which we're not uh, a team amongst ourselves isolated, trying to come up with ideas on our own. We're using this cycle to identify things that come up, transfer it to the product team, and then execute. Same thing with in, uh, internal feedback from employees. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to, oh, I have one more slide. Sorry. So just to summarize here, 14,000 volunteers are added to the platform each year. 3,000 nonprofits are added each year. Uh, during COVID last year, memberships grew 200%. And that's kind of allowed us in the last three years to expand projects and sessions, to fully redesign Taproot Plus, um, to launch a small business offering during the pandemic, and to launch two to three features or updates per month. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kristen, who's going to introduce our nonprofit partner. Thank you, Josh. So great to see those accomplishments. And um, as I said, Taproot Foundation built Taproot Plus in 2014 for the purposes of scaling access to pro bono. And as you can see with those numbers, really, that really happened, especially if you can compare them um, to what we were able to accomplish previously. We're really proud of that, especially um, being able to reach more nonprofits in more parts um, of the country. Um, so uh, with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Terry. I started to introduce Terry Altman uh, a little bit earlier. Terry is the founder and CEO of Rebirth Education Empowerment. Rebirth Education Empowerment, or REE, is all about clearing a path to economic stability for young adults in Dallas's underserved communities. A startup nonprofit, their programs are set to launch in early 2021 and will provide pre-apprenticeship training and placement in union and non-union construction jobs, all with the goal of making economic opportunities available to all of their neighbors. That's so cool. We're so grateful to have you, Terry. Terry has such an interesting pro bono story. First connecting with Taproot volunteers in March 2020 and complete a handful of really impactful projects. So Terry's going to tell us all about that. Terry, thank you so much for joining us. It's such so great to have you. Hi, Kristen. Thank you. 
Uh, so yes, we are really excited to be here and to share our story. Taproot has been a really instrumental. Uh, as Kristen stated, Rebirth Empowerment Education is a startup organization. Um, and we have, like most startup organizations, our pain point is human capital <laughs> resources. And so when, after learning about Taproot, we really took an opportunity to um, kind of do a deep dive into some of the projects. We went through their project guides and identified the ones that were going to be best for us to help us build a foundation for long-term sustainability. And in doing so, uh, the resources that they provided there we was really instrumental in helping us uh, prioritize and identify which projects we would do first. We have completed a number of projects with Taproot uh, skill-based volunteers to include business planning, uh, a financial management system through the QuickBooks uh, set up for nonprofits, uh, key fundraising messaging, all the things that nonprofits really need to have in place uh, to be successful. And what I found is that using the tools that they provided uh, on their website, such as you know the project planning tools, scoping, um, even just kind of telling you with a little short video how to best choose your volunteer has been really instrumental for us. And what, next slide, Kristen. Thank you. So uh, one of the main projects that we completed was a project that we uh, submitted to uh, implement a solution to support our remote work. Uh, we primarily would work with uh, college students, uh, but at the same time, we really needed someone with the skills to do uh, what we needed to do. And so we submitted a request for a, a SharePoint hub site. And, our primary goal was to increase communication engagement um, for our project teams as well as our leadership. And Robert uh, answered the call and he was absolutely wonderful. And, and right now, I think I will turn it over to him to kind of give what um, we did together. Thank you, Terry. And good morning, everyone. As we, as we start off, you know, getting our highlights of our, our project. A couple of things that I think that Josh mentioned is really important, and that is identifying work and implementation. And what I think when we chose how we are going to support and manage the implementation of the intranet, uh, those principles were right in line with the method that we applied, which is called Kanban. And, you know, Kanban has its own vocabulary of terms, cards, cycle time, those types of things. Uh, we chose Kanban primarily because um, it's a pretty easy tool to get started. And since this is the first project that Terry and I worked on together, it was is a good entry point. Other agile methods can have heavier methodologies. So we just decided to start off with, with Kanban for our project. Um, and that's not to say that there's not rigor or um, enforcement of process in Kanban, but it was it was right for us. Um, and with uh, Kanban, there are many tools that are out there in the marketplace. Josh showed a couple. We decided to use Microsoft Planner, and that's primarily because of preference within Rebirth, which is which was a, a good fit for us. Um, so really, kind of the foundations with Kanban that we have took in the project is really citing the requirements, understanding what we're doing, breaking those down into what are called cards and moving those through a work channel. And we've got a slide later to show that. Um, and I think maybe what's maybe just another brief point on Agile, you know, if I may, and Josh laid it out very well and many of his principles is the willingness and the acceptance that things will change. And also the willingness and acceptance that customers will change their minds, which is expected and frankly um, requested. Hey, how does this look? This isn't necessarily what I was really hoping for. Can we tweak this? Absolutely, let's put it on the board and move it for the next cycle. Um, so also one real quick point about Kanban and how we applied it is, we did not just put things on electronic board. We met regularly. We did not lose the human element 
of communicating. So I felt that that was kind of a good strategy for our project. Um, so if I may, Josh, next slide. Um, and Josh also used the term product roadmap, and that was key in our Kanban work definition. So we did a discovery session, and this is just a, an example of one form of a product roadmap laid out in a visual manner. So Terry helped me understand, you know, what her vision was for the intranet, the data landscape, the information landscape, the user landscape, everything's that, well, much of what you would need in order to put a plan together and start building. So this was a real key input. And it helped me as a support resource to understand the why of what we were building so that maybe I could add some creativity and offer ideas and, and Terry could help me with uh, calibrating those ideas, tell me where I was on, tell me where I was off, those types of things. So regardless of what agile method you use, a product roadmap like Josh mentioned is, is suggested. Um, maybe if I made next uh, slide, Josh, thank you. So here's, you know, again, really kind of the core elements of a, of a Kanban board. A Kanban, again, is, is really something that could be easily applied. It can be for unplanned work in a service function or a or a planned work in our case in building out the intranet. So from our product roadmap, what did we do? We built out our cards and our to-do list and our SharePoint and our SharePoint planner and our Microsoft planner. We met regularly. And what we really challenged our work efforts is to minimize WIP. Um, and that is the in progress. Is the work defined clearly in the to-do list? Are we kind of holding off before we start things, before we finish them? And, and again, the implementation, you know, the done column um, is the work built, tested, documented, and really accepted, you know, by the rebirth organization before we really call it done. And it's an iterative process, you know, as we learn what is expected, that helps us in our to-do list to be uh, better maintained. Um, and I think maybe just a couple of things just from our project, we didn't necessarily work on the metrics of cycle time or some of the other kind of formalities of Kanban, but really on are we building what we need to build and are we trying to minimize WIP? So I think, uh, you know, Josh and Kristen and Terry, that's what we try to apply in our, in our project. Oh, Terry, you're on mute. We need to hear you. <laughs> I'm so sorry, Ricky move. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Robert. Uh, so what you're looking at on the screen now is that finished product that, that Robert talked about. And I say finished, but uh, it really is always a work in progress. What he built was a great foundation for our organization to get started and grow. Uh, within After using having this product, we were able to uh, build in... Um, processes in each SharePoint hub for each department to include, you know, our case management system. Uh, the board now has a, a, a place where they communicate, make decisions. Sorry, I think I keep muting myself. Talk with my hands. Uh, but this is a really something that will grow with our organization as we continue to grow as we serve our community um, and has been instrumental to increase our engagement to increase our communication um, and as well as knowledge management um, you do, you never know I recently moved and you never know how many pieces of paper you have until you have to pack it and this is a great place the, uh, for everyone to be able to share those resources and that information and for the staff, the board, and our team to be able to access it um, all in one place. So one of the other uh, things that the internet was able to do for us is we had a, a, we're looking at various board portals, and if you've ever looked at any of the solutions, they're very expensive. And as I mentioned, Taproot has been a, a great resource for human capital. Uh, and we were able, uh, Robert was able to build in the processes for uh, a board portal that included recruiting a board pipeline. 
um, to also increase our capacity to to get rebirth up and going. Next slide. Thank you, Terry. So, um, yeah, so I think you know uh, with the with the next agile method that we chose, we chose Scrum, um, and admittedly, Scrum does require more rigor and more process control than Kanban. And the reason why we chose Scrum in this particular project is because we expanded our team, we brought on a student to be part of our our development resources, and you know, part of this project was not only first and foremost building the functionality that Rebirth needed, but we also took this as an opportunity to help mentor uh, a local student in one of the universities that uh, Terry was able to, to bring on more, more people, so it was great. Um, and so what we did is we did right size the application of Scrum for our team. Uh, we had our product owner, which was Terry, she's the functional owner. We had myself as the scrum master and last but not least the student as the developer and the principles of agile that josh was introducing earlier apply here as well do you have your product roadmap is it clear what we're building and as terry helped us with building what's called you know essentially a backlog list we we gathered what the what the strategy was and that is how do we build a set of capabilities to onboard and manage board of directors onboarding and offboarding. Uh, next slide, Josh, if that's okay. So here is, um, you know, here essentially is a visual on, on Scrum. It could be a little bit of, a, of an eye chart, um, but this can be a very powerful uh, work technique when you have significantly complex systems or even just a team of uh, diverse individuals that are working together to build a product, regardless if that's in a software application, or, or what have you, or a piece of intellectual property. And so Scrum, again, is built on that notion of product uh, work identification, implementation, and really agreement of, of, that, uh, of that work. And again, I think what Scrum also helps us with is um, identifying work at the outset of a work cycle, which we call a sprint, and minimizing interruptions of the team. And so I think that's what we also tried to do with our project is, boy, at the beginning of that sprint, was the backlog or the work identified well enough? Did we proceed through the work cycle effectively? And then had the student present to Terry, you know, the work that he was able to accomplish. So that's why we chose Scrum. Uh, might be a little little heavy for what we were doing, but nonetheless, we saw it as a, as a good tool to, to build ultimately what Terry was looking for and to help somebody arm himself with working in the in the professional sector. And so the outcome of that is through the uh, completion of artifacts on the Scrum pipeline, uh, we built electronic forms. And those forms included electronic data collection of a prospect form and an application. And once that data is collected, what do we do with it? Well, we want to drive workflow and process. And so we use Microsoft Flow to take that data and organize it in a way so that Terry and her team could work. Meaning, here's our data. Let's start to revise the, the, the records as we proceed through our process, onboard people, vet them, et cetera, et cetera. So that was really the functionality that we ultimately were able to build in this project. So with that, I think um, that kind of concludes the bulk of our presentation. Um, I think we'll look through the comments and see if there are any specific questions that uh, we can answer with the remaining time. Yeah, folks, we have, uh, please drop your questions in the comments box. We have one question in here and I think Robert, you started to uh, maybe answer this. So maybe Robert and Josh, you can both speak to this a little bit. Um, in taking a more formal Scrum approach, um, how did how did your how did you get folks to participate internally um, from the different maybe business units that were relevant to the to the process to the conversation? Maybe Robert, you can start, and then Josh. 
give some insights? Sure. Yeah. And I think well, with Terry and I, with bringing on these students, you know, it was a real good opportunity to essentially to help them um, learn how to perform work in a professional manner. So the onboarding, you know, was really more educational. Uh, now, certainly in other organizations, it can be an organizational change technique or tactic that you might need to get to get people engaged and supportive. But for us, Terry, unless you see differently, it was really just more of a of an educational opportunity for a student. And there was real acceptance and um, a lot of interest. Yes, I, I agree with that. The students were really engaged. Um, they, they started, you know, a student is engaged when they start posting information about their project on social media. So, <laughs> but it was really helpful. So on the um, Taproot side, I can actually give you two use cases. So we have a external case where we tend to do this and also internal. Uh, starting with the internal case first, um, I tend to like our team to lead with a uh, survey structure that's tailored to the work that we plan to partake in. Um, what we like to do first is give uh, our fellow employees, we're a small organization, so we're 46 people, but we like to give them an understanding of what we're trying to achieve by this work. Um, and really focus in on the people who are really invested in giving feedback and sorting through that feedback in order to start making decisions. So when I talk about earlier about stakeholders, it's about getting them involved as early in the process as possible and then keeping them updated as we move towards our end goal to make their investment feel like they're a big part of this project. Uh, externally, it does function somewhat of the same way, uh, but more of a hands-on approach uh, we do some focus groups, um, some joint calls of just scoping and problem solving, and that helps kind of define like the scope of work that we plan to work through in that given time period. And Josh, if I may, just don't, I think it's an excellent point, if I may, is, you know, just for us, I mean, I think there was education in terminology, what we are doing and why we are doing it and the benefits of following this particular process. So it's not process for process sake. It's process because there's value in following this particular work method and there's reasons why we're doing things. So I think just the educational side was really just something I thought I would reinforce, Josh. Thanks for that. Thank you both. Um, well, all three of you. Um, so we have another question and certainly I could answer it as uh, and uh, as kind of a, an expert in pro bono and connecting volunteers and all profits this way, but I'd actually, I'd be curious if for Terry and Robert, if it came up in your work together or maybe Terry and other work you've done. Um, so the question is sometimes there is a disconnect between what a charity or a client wants and what they actually need. You see this all the time in consulting, but especially pro bono. Can you tell us about some ways that you can help manage expectations? So I don't know, maybe I'll start, uh, Terry, it sounds like you have, it seems like you have a thought top of mind, so we can start with you. And then I'm curious, Robert, if it's come up with you in this setting or other kind of consulting skill volunteering uh, work you've done. Terry, do you wanna start us off? Yeah, that's a great question um, because as a nonprofit and, and organizing and building rebirth, uh, that's that's my area of expertise. I have an idea when I'm submitting my request through Taproot, you know, I write that little description of what the project is and I try to articulate what it is that I, I would like as an end result, right? But what I have found to be very instrumental uh, and I think with the work that we did with Robert and, and work I've done with other um, uh, Taproot volunteers, is a during that first session taproot has all of those you know suggestions of what you should do interview the volunteer make sure they're a good fit for you they have the scoping form for you they have the planning you know they have all those tools there we utilize those tools but what i found is when i explain to the taproot volunteer and they're listening and i say this is what i want to be able to do it is very important to listen to what their their feedback is because what you think you want may not be what you need right because i'm like oh i need this 
and then the, the volunteer says, well, actually, this may be better. And that's, I think, how Robert and I work really well together because I allow him to be the expert in that field. That's the whole purpose of using that skill-based volunteer. Yeah, I, I think that's, well, you know, when Terry and I started working together, I mean, one of the, I mean, Taproot Template are great. I think it was a very strong reduction in us getting acquainted on the, the effort. We did a discovery session, which is kind of, you know, maybe a different flavor or format of the Taproot uh, project management tools. And it was really important to me to listen and understand, you know, what Terry really wanted to accomplish. And I think that really helped us uh, and she was very receptive to this way of working in Agile because, boy, do I know exactly what she wants? Probably not until I start putting things in front of her to get her feedback, you know. And so I think that that's really was beneficial for us is me having maybe the comfort and confidence to put something in front of her and she being supportive and helpful in calibrating what I'm doing. And I think just, you know, beyond all the, the work methods if you've got a really good relationship with your client and your client is willing to help, um, you know, it can just really improve, you know, the productivity between the teams. And thanks for sharing. Josh, anything to add as far as kind of managing some of those expectations uh, with the work within Taproot? Um, I would just echo uh, listening as like a big part of this. Um, our team does a lot of collaborative work internally. And a lot of times when I work across teams, especially with our advisor services team, it feels like an engagement where you're working with external partners sometimes, just because they're coming from the background where they're not, um, technology is not a big piece of what we've traditionally done. Um, but most of the time what it comes down to is just really trying to understand what the core problem is that they're trying to solve uh taking a step back and mapping out a plan and then being collaborative about that plan with them uh, when you share it so oftentimes after i sit back and come up with a solution we're having another call to review what what the potential potential solution is and make any changes right then and there to fit the real scope of what they actually want to achieve Thank you. Yeah, and I can say um, as far as, you know, Taproot, how in our programming, um, we definitely take that consi into consideration, the need to have a, a touch point to align on the actual, the actual problem that the project is meant to solve. So on Taproot Plus, we do that in allowing um, the potential volunteer and nonprofit representative to connect for a conversation prior to any commitment to working on a project. And that allows some just sharing and align, you know, of expectations, uh, of goals for the project. And there can be that alignment right there. And we actually hear feedback from our nonprofit clients all the time that that conversation will sometimes result in them changing the request they're making from a volunteer or adding onto um, the request because there are layers that they did not consider before. Um, so that does come up quite often. All right. Um, so uh, this is a question, uh, I'll, and please keep sending in the, 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 the comments and questions. Um, I have a question. I think, I guess, again, it's for Robert and Josh, and maybe Robert, you can start us off. Uh, I'm just wondering if it's, it's you both have uh, for profit and nonprofit experience. So you've done work with for profits and nonprofits. And I'm curious if your product management experience is different in working with to those two different mm -hmm. stakeholder groups. That's an excellent question. It's, you know, my experience primarily is in the prof, in the for, for profits, for profit sector. Um, you know, I just really, I was a, you know, kind of a local volunteer at many organizations and, you know, frankly, um, you know, Terry has been very patient with me as I've maybe brought some terminology when it comes around, you know, maybe some CRM type of things in our case, but She's been very patient with me in helping to explain kind of the nonprofit sector um, and 
you know, the willingness and the ability to, you know, the willingness to learn and adapt, I think is important maybe for a taproot volunteer is, gosh, I've got this one way of thinking, but the nonprofit sector maybe has a different philosophy, mentality or culture. Um, I think it's, I think it's a fun opportunity for taproot volunteers if they're, if they're interested in really expanding their, their point of view. Um, So uh, my experience is uh, mostly for profit uh, before this. This is actually the first time I've worked at a nonprofit. Um, in my past, I've been at Fortune 500s. I've been at small startups and even uh, trying to create startups of my own. Um, this opportunity, this job feels a lot more like that. Like I said, early stage uh, startup kind of environment. Um, I think my first year at Taproot was was really feeling out the process of working at a nonprofit full time and like how was that going to work? Was a dynamic between teams internally. Um, by year two, it was really more so about hitting the ground running with uh, putting my imprint and my background on the organization from a technology standpoint. Yeah, if if I maybe just one more point is I think you can apply you know many of the work methods in the for profit sector in the nonprofit sector. And just your, your, you know, your, the terminology of the product that you're building may change, but your work style can kind of be fairly transferable. Um, my experience, at least. Have you? Did you experience or have you experienced any differences in how decisions are made, or what considerations are at play in making decisions around technology? For, for, uh, jump in if you have a if you have a thought. Robert, did you have a thought? Um, uh, yeah, well, I just maybe you know, Terry. I think for us, you know, I think we had a, if I may, a, a pretty kind of business vigilant philosophy in our project together. I mean, we had a we had a deliverable, we had a time frame, and we had a budget. And so, you know, the budget being essentially, let's really minimize the procurement of additional tools and let's use the resources that we have in front of us. And so, you know, I think we use kind of a business centric mentality, so to say, um, but really, you know, the, the mission though, right. The, the drive to build this ultimately for the sake of human good. I think maybe that's kind of the, maybe the difference, at least again, I'm just speaking for myself, but um, Terry, just want to see if you felt the same on that. Or Mute it, Terry. Still, I'm still a rookie at it after a year of technology, <laughs> Zoom. But I, I have over 20 something years uh, experience in owning and operating a for profit organization. And so, what I found that uh, although, you know, it's called nonprofit, um, in order to build capacity and sustainability, you really need to focus on being able to operate um, as if it was a for-profit. You know, you have to use those same systems, uh, especially in technology. That's kind of where some nonprofits really maybe not invest, you know, as much. But I think it's important in, in building that foundation and having that technology and being able to streamline the processes um and and build that capacity you know you know say for instance financial management was one of our our um projects with taproot you know if there is a difference between setting up quickbooks for a for-profit and a non-profit who knew uh but the taproot volunteer was able to help me understand and actually use the terminology for each and put them together so that they were kind of interchangeable it's like well we call it this but this is what it is, right? Uh, so I think a lot of of the for profit is actually transferable over knowledge is transferable over into a nonprofit. It just may be using a different, a little different terminology or approach in a, a different manner. So that's what you. We have a comment here from um, uh, a participant who said they've been reading um, "Ask Your Developer" by Jeff Lawson. CEO of Twilio, 
and it advocates for adopting a build or die mindset for organizations. And it sounds uh, similar to what you're saying. It's so interesting because even within Tapper, we've been talking a lot about that. And that's even more true, I think, for technology. And probably you folks are uh, more more equipped to speak to it than I. But, um, you know, the, the um, ability to commit to something with the, you know, uh, while at the same time understanding that it might need to change. Right. And um, we've all been tested to change in that, and that. That's such a broad statement over the last year. I mean, in different ways and some, some of us in many ways. Um, but as organizations and in management and thinking about how to deliver our services, how to manage our services um, in the future, it's really, I think, and again, we've seen this at Taproot pushed us to be more decisive. You know, because um, uh, again, with the understanding, with the flexibility in mind, with, with the uh, uh, understanding that the the continue there might be a continued need to be agile, um, to work with some ambiguity, right? Um, and yeah, that's so it's so it's so relevant, and yeah, even more true, I think, with technology. Uh, Terry, I'm curious. Um, you've spoken to it a little bit, but you know, it seems like uh, pro bono has really uh, allowed you, enabled you to think about um, technology in a new way for your organization. As you think about the future, um, we've heard a little bit about the work that's happened and is happening within the organization. Do you see other opportunities for pro bono and specifically tech pro bono potentially to drive innovation um, within, within your organization? Uh, yes, as I mentioned, the system that uh, we built, the internet that we built with Robert was really a foundation. Um, you know, we engaged it, he built it on a platform where, you know, we, I never knew anything about list, SharePoint list, <laughs> you know, and all the different things that they can do, you know, you can do with it. Uh, so I do believe that um, the platform is built for growth. Uh, and you talk about change, you know, and what's happened over the past year, we have to be able to adapt and pivot, you know, and, and sometimes that, you know, means being able, you know, technology, every year there's something different and new coming out and, and something we need to add. And so I see that as being part of a foundation that is, just something that's going to be growth over a period of time and instrumental to us, like I stated, uh, the longevity and sustainability of the organization. Um, being able to communicate effectively, to share information, to make decisions. You know, nonprofits, we, we, we have a board. <laughs> and our board, most of, most of our board members are very, very busy executives, you know, doing their own thing somewhere else. But there are times when we need to have them engage right away. Um, and the system that we build, you know, utilizing Teams, uh, utilizing the SharePoint list where they can actually, you know, our project, we can identify prospects for new board members. And Robert would have to help me with the flow because he knows more about it, but we can identify those prospects. All the board members can review the prospects. Then they can, you know, make nominations for the board and they can vote on it all within our little SharePoint site. So yes, I, I can see technology being a part. Where we go from here will only, you know, it will be incremental uh, as the organization grows. Yeah, thank you for that, Terry. It's great. Um, so I think maybe we have quite room time for one or two more questions. So this one is going to be uh, for Josh to start. Um, Josh, you know, you were talking about how this is the first nonprofit you've worked within, and I'm curious if you have anything to share with the audience around how nonprofits might more broadly adopt some agile methodologies and 
And I'm thinking, you know, in how you're even seeing that within Taproot and some of our other teams and departments. Right. So um, this was my first job at a nonprofit. Um, but the experience I had before this coming into it was that my mother actually worked for a nonprofit for years, uh, the Girl Scouts Foundation. Um, so she gave me a little bit of a lay of the land about what to expect, right? And, you know, one of the things that comes up within nonprofits is uh, the idea of collaborative work is something that's a little bit new. Um, and in that, you have to kind of establish yourself as a, a resource across different teams. So in my role, being in charge of like the technology arm of this organization, I'm also thinking about business strategy. I'm thinking about these are things that I can do with my team that helps make it easier for everyone else in the organization. Because when it kind of comes time for me to get buy-in, when it comes time for me to collaborate, it makes it a lot easier that I've kind of led with that value first uh, in order to kind of get that back in order to move some of the things we need forward. Yeah, that's great. Um, it's been cool for me to even see how um, different teams have maybe even at the project level utilized, you know, things like stand up to make sure things are kept on track. Um, again, not necessarily as a team meeting, but just in a con during a concentrated time, just to make sure certain things are moving forward. I know um, even the organization in uh, in immediate uh, aftermath of the kind of pandemic hitting, kind of the shutdown uh, last March, um, even leadership adopted a stand up approach um, to just because of the need for kind of quicker decision making to happen and quick information sharing. Um, and that was really helpful. And we've seen that uh, throughout throughout the organization. It's been fun to see and we get good feedback on that, that it's helped projects stay um, on time, on track and folks feel more informed. They for, feel more engaged with the work of the organization as well. So there's that benefit on, on morale. Terry, do you see that in any of your, um, uh, uh, even thinking about not only your current experience with your, your, your nonprofit, but in the other work that you've done, have you seen um, the opportunity or the utilization of agile methodologies to move certain projects forward? And do you see that? I know you're getting, you're getting ready to roll out your programming, right, um, very soon. So um, do you see any opportunity there even to adopt some of these methodologies um, to make sure you know, you're meeting your, your early goals? Absolutely. Um, actually, the project that we did with the internet was really a learning uh, opportunity, educational opportunity for me. Uh, and so I kind of would like Robert to share this answer with me because I learned how to use the planner. I learned how to use task managers. <laughs> I, I, I may not have all the right terms, but I know where they are in the internet to click and schedule tasks and, and keeping each team on, on point with that, um, you know, being able to schedule um, and identify, you know, what the process is for, for various items in each department and how we're going to start assigning those items to individuals, you know, being able to kind of go through that. Robert, can you help me out? So, so it doesn't say, I mean, I'm not using the right terminology, so I don't want to say this thing that. <laughs> Made sense to me, Terry. <laughs> yeah, but no, philosophically, right, I think if it's okay to say, Terry, I mean, you know, if you bring a sense of accountability, you know, to the work that you're really marching towards, for profit, not for profit, with our students from um, you know UT Dallas, Texas, you know, boy, do we have a mission, a deliverable in mind? This procedure of how we're going to identify our work, uh, make sure that's well understood, reporting status, and helping each other. And so Terry's half teasing, half not, as I was almost kind of pulling for her to help me to make sure that I was clear on what I was doing and my head in the right direction. So. Um, it can really be a big team builder. And 
that's where I really think agile, I think is a very personally, I think it's a very superior work method over maybe the traditional waterfall because people just not necessarily maybe know what they want until they see it. And sometimes it can interrupt team dynamics if you're waiting for something to get built for three months when it may not be what the customer needs. Um, that's my testimonial on it. And Terry was very receptive to it. I think one thing that uh, we didn't add is that what we built uh, in the intranet actually complements our case management system. So for that department for case management, you know, when Robert asked, what are some of the processes? He really learned, Robert really learned what a case manager does, right? <laughs> and he was able to build in some systems, uh, you know, in planning, in, in the task manager, um, and just and being able to go from A to to B on what a case manager does from intake into, you know, first engagement with a client and intake. And we are able to use the SharePoint intranet in conjunction with our case management system. So, I mean, there's so many um, opportunities. Yeah, just, let, just last comment there. I mean, Josh said it. We, we defined our product roadmap. And it's the entire organization. You know, it's not only the data collection and information sharing on the internet. It's building applications. It's helping rebirth, accelerate process, um, ultimately to help Terry's constituents. I mean, that's kind of the mission. You know, yeah. that it really is powerful. The what a, a well built system tool can do for an organization. Um, on all fronts, internally, externally, engaging your stakeholders, engaging your staff, um, the internal communications tool that it can be, et cetera. So I know we have one minute left and we had a couple of questions about Taproot Plus. So I'll, I'll just close in, in mentioning uh, that a little bit. Um, we had, did have a good question about um, the, the supply and demand ratio of volunteers and nonprofits and what Taproot sees. And it's a very good question. Generally speaking, uh, Taproot and you know uh, our partners typically see a far more number of volunteers seeking opportunities than nonprofits making the request. So it's not necessarily about need, it's just about making the request. It's also a little bit of a loaded question and answer because it's a moving target. Of course, we might have a large number of volunteers engaged uh, or signed up on our Taproot Plus platform, but it's got to be the right time for them in their life to engage. They have to find the right project that needs the right skills, matches what they're looking for. So it's a little bit of a moving target. But we're always looking to add both. And Taproot Plus is available for any nonprofit, registered nonprofit or public school, um, as well as any volunteer in the United States, um, as well as India and uh, the EU. Um, it's been a real, real pleasure to be with you. I just really want to thank again, uh, of course, Josh, um, for all the work he's done on this presentation, all the work he's done uh, with Tap for Taproot, and um, to 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 continue to kind of build a vision for Taproot Plus and the technology broadly for Taproot and how it can further support the organization and its uh, objectives. I want to thank, of course, Terry, not only for joining but for your um, critical work that you're doing um, on the ground um, in Dallas. So thank you for that and for joining and for your use of our services. And Robert, uh, thank you for continuing to make Taproot operate because it is without, without our volunteers, we would not be a thing. Um, so thank you for your contribution to Taproot, but um, I can echo I'm sure to Terry and I hope you'll continue to participate um, and give back in this way. Your skills are needed. Thank you very much, everybody. I hope you have a great day.